Okay, so this is the house that blew up. Exactly what we're talking about right here. Very early on in my career. I'm contracting. Hey, I'm Joel Walsman, CEO and Master Electrician of Jefferson Electric. This is video three of a four-part series where we're discussing electrical services, primarily in the context of your home. I'm gonna briefly assemble some of the major components here and talk about where the responsibility of the utility company starts and stops and some of the requirements that you need to be aware of. This is my 200 amp meter cabinet. This is a two inch threaded hub that's rain tight. I'm going to apply Nolox or antioxidation compound to every threaded ferrous exterior connection. In this case, the uh, screws that secure my hub to the top of the meter fitting, I'm gonna both waterproof those screws as well as prevent rust in case of servicing. Those screws only need to be hand tight. I would utilize all four screws in a real installation. I'm gonna also apply Nolox, which is this heavy, gooey, doesn't come off your hands or out of your clothes kind of compound to the threads on my PVC male adapter. That is not for the purpose so much of rust inhibition. It, it is on my, my ferrous, my steel hub, but it's also for the, for the purpose of um, preventative water displacement. I'm gonna tighten that down, hand tight, and then probably another full revolution uh, without scarring the fitting and looking unprofessional. Ah, that's good and tight. And then this. PVC conduit. This becomes my service riser. Of course, I would glue it in real world application, fully seat it inside of the fitting. Sometimes the conduit and fitting wanna really fight and buck against a full seat. In that case, I would take flathead screwdriver, Sharpie pencil, something, and put a mark on where that conduit has seated and remove the conduit and ensure I've got a full seat, which I do. This is a two inch PVC weather head. This is the point at the top of the service riser where the customer's responsibility stops. The wire exits this weather head and at that point converts to utility overhead wiring and becomes the utility responsibility. At the end of this video, I'm gonna tell you a true story that happened to me about the house that blew up. The very first house I ever wired. So a couple things you'll note about wiring transitions at the weatherhead. One is oftentimes the utility overhead wiring is a much smaller wire gauge than the building wire. And that's a number of different reasons. One significant reason is that the utility overhead service drop is bound by different rules. The utility is not bound by the national electrical code as the building wire, wiring is, which would govern the rules that the electrical contractor would utilize to size the wire. So two different set of standards. The second significant difference is that the utility overhead drop is exposed to free air. That means the wiring has the ability to dissipate heat and is required to be a different size. A smaller size is acceptable as opposed to wiring that's contained within this conduit is concealed and protected, which is a plus, but it is also inhibited from dissipating heat. So you'll notice sometimes that the wiring exit the weather head be as big around as your thumb, whereas the utility wiring might be smaller than your pinky. Substantial difference. And that's the reasoning behind those differences. The utility drop must be a clear line of sight from the utility pole to the weather head. There cannot be obstructions. Quick story, there was a pine tree. A customer's pine tree was sitting directly between the utility pole and the weather head and the point of attachment to the house. And that service drop rubbed on the pine tree for who knows how long, probably years and years because that pine tree was 30 feet tall. And eventually it rubbed through the insulation on the conductors. That service drop sat there and smoked and popped inside the pine tree for a couple of hours before it finally burned itself free, scorched the side of the pine tree, big old burnt hole in the pine tree, and then fell free and was hanging live in the middle of the customer's backyard. And so you really wanna ensure a clear line of sight. If that line of sight is not clear due to foliage, 
That foliage is the customer's responsibility if it's not in the right-of-way. It's typically only the utility responsibility if the foliage is in the right-of-way or the utility easement. So ensure a clear line of sight. Typically, if there's a detached accessory structure like a garage, then a minimum of three feet of clearance is required between the garage roof and the service drop, because that service drop will sag either over time or with snow and ice load. There are two methods of attaching a utility service drop to a house. This porcelain P-knob is insulated and it's a lag style P-knob. It is designed for a wood frame structure penetrating something like vinyl siding and uh, sheathing all the way into the stud of the house. This would need to be secured to a framing member in order to be suitable and sound. In the installation of the P-knob, because it's a penetration through the exterior of the home, we would also provide a high quality sealant to prevent water infiltration. Uh, another associated style of P-knob, just like this actually, is a machine thread P-knob, and that is uh, designed for masonry anchors into a masonry home, like brick or stone. Second style of P-knob is this clamp-on style, and also porcelain and insulated, but in this case, it's designed to be secured to a mast, a service riser that has been designed and is suitable according to the utility standards to actually become the point of attachment. Those service risers typically will penetrate through the soffit of a home, through the roof, be secured by fittings as well as the structure of the home, and will often be required to have an additional tie back from the mast to the roof to ensure rigidity and support. And this would then clamp around the service riser in this fashion. Like I said, PVC is not a suitable mast or service riser when that's the point of a connection. It would need to be IMC or rigid conduit. <laughs> okay, so this is the house that blew up, exactly what we're talking about right here. Very early on in my career, I'm contracted uh, by a 501c3 that specializes in low-income housing. So they'll take these old dilapidated properties, use primarily volunteer labor to put the houses together and, um, and then place low-income individuals in the home, similar to Habitat for Humanity. So volunteers have wired this entire house. I'm brought in in the, the ninth hour to button things up on a Friday. And so I'm all over the house. I'm plugs and switches and panels and I'm, I'm just taking care of correcting all kinds of um, kind of handyman volunteer code issues. I'm toning out wires. I'm trying to make, you know, switching work. It's not working. There's just all kinds of troubles. I'm working my way systematically through the project. So I get everything buttoned up. The homeowner's moving in that night and the following morning. And uh, the next day, this is Saturday, I'm at a family reunion with my extended family. I look at my phone. I've got a voicemail from their head of construction. I very, very sheepishly on Saturday, you know, listen to this voicemail and the head of construction is breaking the bad news. He's like, Joel, I don't know what's going on here. I have no idea, but I need to call back A S A. I need to call back yesterday, Joel. The house is literally blowing up right now, like light bulbs exploding in the living room. The TV just arced and this, this billow of smoke is pouring out of the television. I'm melting. I'm I'm at the family reunion, I'm just, I'm perishing. I have done it again, <laughs> what is going on here? I don't even know how to explain these symptoms. Like the whole house, the whole house, bar none, is going haywire. They're plugging appliances in, stuff's flashing and arcing and smoking. I'm petrified. I call my supervising electrician and I explain the situation and he's like, you know it's exactly what's happening? It's a loose neutral. The neutral is pulled loose somewhere in the electrical service and now the circuits that should be seen 120 volts are seeing double voltage. They're, they're feeding phase to phase. And essentially, the, the voltage of the entire home has been doubled. So appliances that are only safely rated to 120 volts, like refrigerator, light bulbs, television, are seeing 240 volts instead. So I get right out there, I'm investigating, and within three minutes, kid you not, three minutes of being on the job site, I found the issue. It was actually the utility connection. It was not my fault. So relieved. It was the utility connection. The wires exiting the weather head were connected to the utility service drop. That neutral had pulled loose and separated. 
So unfortunately, in the case of the house that blew up, the utility company, although culpable, was not responsible for any damages within the home. So the natural question is, how do you prevent this situation? Well, it's difficult to prevent because everything was tested upon completion and that's a vital, vital performance of an electrician is to test all your work with proper test equipment. In this case, everything tested fine and that's a part that came loose the following day, potentially um, disrupted by the wind, we don't know. But if that ever happens to you and you see electricity that's not functioning properly, shut off that circuit or shut off your entire home. Call a licensed electrician and do not continue using power. Those indicators, flickering lights, uh, malfunctioning power and arc flash are all extremely dangerous and you should discontinue using power. So electricity that's fully working is typically just fine and not um, imminently going to cause any problems. Electricity that's non-functioning completely is typically not a sign of a significant imminent hazard. But it's that in-between spectrum when electricity becomes really unsafe. An insurance adjuster once told me that every time, bar none, when there's been an electrical fire in a home, he always asks the question, so how long have your lights been flickering? And the response is typically, well, a couple of weeks or a couple of months. That is an excellent precursory identifier of an electrical hazard. If anything's in that in-between spectrum of partial functionality, that could be a connection that is coming loose on hot or neutral conductors. And when a hot conductor begins to separate, then that causes, or, or the corrosion begins to build up, that causes resistance. And resistance means heat and heat means the potential for fire. And so that partial functionality that is the most dangerous zone for electricity to be in, shut it off, discontinue use, don't take a chance. Further underground requirements. Sometimes directional boring is required because there are alleys, sidewalks, or other obstructions in place. That uh, directional bore will utilize an HDPE conduit. That conduit is color-coded and should be black with a red stripe Per utility requirements. Every color indicates something to an excavation or industry professional and that color marking is significant. Further requirements of the trench are this. Typically 36 inches of cover are required over the conduit or cable. What's cover? Cover is dirt on top of the electrical system. That's physically 36 inches of dirt. Do me a favor, when you're backfilling that dirt, backfill about 10 to 12 inches, tamp it down. Work to minimize the amount of settling that's gonna take place later. Backfill another 12 inches of dirt, tap it down. Backfill another 12 inches, tamp it down. And you will end up with excess dirt because the physic, it's never gonna be as compact as it was originally and the electrical installation is physically taking up some space. So I have a plan for uh, removing spoils from the site and heap that trench up just a little bit because you know it's gonna to settle too. True story. Family is swimming in their pool, in-ground pool at their estate on a Saturday afternoon. As the family members begin to exit the pool one at a time, they're getting shocked. Like literally, one foot in the pool, one foot on the pool deck, and bam, they get nailed. There's an electric <laughs> shock um, that's being experienced as the family's exiting the pool. So they're in this like, if we're in the water, we're okay. If we're on the pool deck, we're okay. But how do we get out of the pool? Like as soon as we touch the pool ladder, bam, the shock goes through our body and it's painful and it's dangerous, of course. Water and electricity do not mix. So effectively, the family extricates themselves from this dangerous pool. We're called in and we start testing the area. We're looking for an excessive drop in voltage that is an indication of leakage um, maybe somewhere between the house and the mini barn or the house and the detached garage or the pool system, lighting and equipment, anything that is energized power in the vicinity. And we can't find anything using test equipment to measure, measuring the differential. And so eventually we turn off power to the entire estate. And those conditions at the pool are still present. So this is why I'm so particular about proper underground distribution systems. In this case, 
the issue was detected in the underground distribution system behind the house coming from the utility company. There was about 500 feet of underground cable and somewhere on that cable it had been damaged potentially due to a sharp element that was introduced in the backfill whether it's a stone that worked its way through the jacket of the cable. Whatever the case may be, the cable was damaged and voltage was leaking into the conductive soils. The pool water became energized, the pool deck was grounded, and there was some suitable voltage differential between the two that the family, when exiting the pool, was shocked and created an extremely hazardous situation. Join us for our next video, part four, for Grid Power.